Right, good morning everyone at home and welcome to this uh, latest uh, waterfront event, Offshore Renewables and Wind um, uh, and Energy Opportunities for Ports. Uh, I'm delighted to join you. I'm Richard Ballantyne, your host uh, from the British Ports Association, uh, the Trade Association for Ports and Harbours. Um, and amongst our membership is a, a kind of long list of uh, energy focused ports who are looking at many of the types of opportunities we're going to explore today. Uh, I haven't got much housekeeping to say because we haven't, obviously, we're not physically there and you can't access uh, things like the uh, on screen speaker functions, microphones, etc. But you can, that doesn't mean you can't interact. So please at home, in your offices, wherever you may be, um, please do lodge some questions for our two speakers. Uh, you can use the Q&A function and we will have lots of time. We're going to have two introductory, uh, short introductory um, pitches, I would say, from our uh, two speakers. And then we'll break for some Q&A and discussion. I've got some questions for the speakers, but um, you may want to lodge some as well. So we look forward to that. Um, we will, uh, we're not having any slides, so there won't be anything circulated after that, but you can find further details about both our speakers on the Waterfront website. And indeed, I'm hoping they're going to introduce themselves a little bit without going through their whole biographies uh, to touch on what they get up to and what they do. Uh, they're not ports, but they are specialists in this field. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome Johnny Gowdy, first of all, from Regan. Uh, Johnny, if you wouldn't mind just giving a few introductory comments. We did circulate your biography, so you don't need to go through your life story, Johnny, but it will be helpful for our um, attendees uh, and those who are watching if you just remind us what Regan does and, and what your role for Regan is. And then perhaps you can share your sort of opening thoughts for about 10 minutes or so, if you can. Uh, on this area of um, economic activity. Over to you, Johnny. Great. Thanks. Uh, um, thanks very much, uh, Richard. And uh, yes, I'm Johnny Gowdy, a director at uh, Regen. And uh, um, I've been working in the energy sector now for getting on for 30 years, I suppose, working initially in oil and gas and moving across to a, uh, renewables uh, about 15 years ago. Um, so Regen, we are a an odd organisation. We're not for profit, um, but are basically a centre of energy expertise providing market insight, analysis, um, support for technology development in the energy sector, specializing in sustainable energy and in particular renewable energy. Uh, so we've been involved in supporting the offshore wind sector going back to the early round one and round two projects, uh, but, but particularly got involved in round three with the projects around the Southwest uh, coast. So we worked on Atlantic Array and Navitas Bay projects in the round three. Um, and did a number of studies at that point looking at port infrastructure. Uh, so if anyone's on the call today, I can give a shout out to people from Portland or Falmouth, uh, Bristol Port, Appledore, uh, Plymouth. Um, of course, our experience in round three um, was a reminder that projects don't always go ahead. So both the Atlantic Array project and the Navitas Bay projects were two of the larger projects that didn't actually happen and were withdrawn for a variety of reasons. And in fact, if you look at projects in round three up the West Coast, so thinking about Celtic Array, Argyle Array, the Down Array, I mean, a bunch of these projects are probably lost to the mysteries of time now, but it's clear that it is very difficult to deploy projects on the Western side of the UK in that deeper water further away from port infrastructure. Um, so that has led to a situation now where we had great success on the East Coast, great success in the Southern North Sea and helping to drive down the costs of offshore wind. Uh, and that has partly been due to the proximity to large port infrastructure and the investment that was made in port infrastructure on the East Coast. It has, however, produced a rather lopsided wind portfolio, and that has introduced a number of system challenges. And we, we touched on that in a paper that we did recently called Go West, uh, if anyone is fans of the Pet Shop Boys out there, we took the title from their song from the 1980s, but I think it's a very apt title. Uh, the, the need, if you like, for us to develop a wider wind portfolio and particularly now to go out to those areas off the western part of the Celtic Sea and up through the north and the west of Scotland. Um, so very pleased to say that there is a new beginning now. There is a new kind of enthusiasm for those projects. And a lot of that's off the back of floating wind and the opportunity that floating wind can present itself. And this does feel like a bit of a, a new era, if you like, breaking out into uh, 
new areas of sea uh, for offshore wind. And ports will be at the forefront of that. And, and, and the good news, I suppose, is we have learned a lot from our experience of deploying 12 gigawatts to date. So we have a good understanding about what the requirements are from ports. And we think about uh, you know, substructure fabrication, turbine assembly, you know, um, the, the mobilization of anchoring and mooring systems, et cetera. All those activities that happen on the port side are reasonably well understood. And there's a couple of questions still outstanding around things like steel versus concrete, but it tends to boil down to the same sort of requirements. And people like the uh, Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult have now done quite a lot of analysis in terms of what are we looking for. And, and it's the same as it ever was. It is land space, quayside, load bearing, uh, water depth alongside and in the approach channels, et cetera. And with floating wind, we have the sort of additional requirements around sheltered seabed area for wet storage of assembled devices before they can be taken out and delivered plus all the amenities and supply chain that we would associate with, with ports. Um, the big challenge though, is one of investment. And again, same as it ever was. Uh, the, the, the Catapult has now done some analysis that suggests we might need to spend something like 2.5 billion on ports on the Western side of the UK, so the Celtic Sea and up through the North and the, uh, the West of Scotland. By the way, that's not to say that we're done with the East Coast by any means. We're still gonna have to be investing in ports on the East Coast and deploying from there. Um, but 2.5 billion, and the challenge of course, is that to bring forward that level of investment, you have to have very good confidence in the pipeline of projects coming forward. And you have to be confident that those projects will go ahead and will use your port services. So the first challenge is to create that pipeline and create that confidence. The second challenge is one of timing, because really we need to start to make that investment in port infrastructure now, maybe even yesterday, in order for projects to go ahead in the future. And necessarily that investment needs to start before you finalize those projects, they've reached financial close, or you've signed commercial terms and, and they made commitments in terms of the port utilization. So that timing issue is a real challenge and it's one that typically will require support from the public sector or from governments in order to overcome those. Um, so, you know, to, to break through that kind of Gordian knot of when do we make the investment versus when do projects go ahead, we will need to have support from the public sector. And that, that's not to say that ports are wholly risk averse. I think we have seen, uh, you know, in the, in the East Coast, for example, ports being willing to make the investment when the timing is right but clearly their appetite for risk is limited. And as we're probably gonna talk about in the conversation, there are lots of other requirements on ports and there's lots of, others, lots of other opportunities out there for ports. So this needs to be seen in the context of the kind of the opportunity cost, if you like, of making a commitment to support offshore wind before you've got that firm kind of commercial arrangements in place. Um, now there's lots of ways in which that public support could come through. I mean, we've seen grant funding um, typically, for, you know, small amounts of seed funding, for example, to do feasibility studies and to get some of the, the areas moving. Public-private partnership and co-investment is clearly an option. Um, you know, where, where ports are held in the public sector in trust, for example, that may be easier, but there's clearly arrangements that can be made for the public sector to make investments. We know that national investment banks, green investment banks, Scottish investment bank, etc., all keen to get involved in port infrastructure. Even the Crown Estate actually is got that clearly in their sites as an area where they might want to make investment. Um, we might also want to think about more creative revenue support models. I mean, we provide revenue support for generators through things like contracts for difference and cap and floor models, et cetera, um, RAB models for nuclear. So why not do that for ports as well, or potentially underwriting the risk? Um, so I'd say that's a necessity. The other thing that we absolutely need, and this is something that Regen has been pushing really hard, not alone, I have to say this, but with others, is we need a properly integrated holistic delivery plan. And I don't mean just for offshore wind, I mean for the whole of the net zero energy transition. And that's been sorely missing to date. We have, we've, we've had targets, we've had various statements around, oh, let's do 40 gigawatts, let's do 50 gigawatts, but we haven't had a proper delivery plan. We're beginning to see that change. I think you know, officials in Bayes, in Ofgem, 
National Grid ESO, the Crown Estate, for instance, for instance, recognizing now that we need to have that underpinning plan and things like holistic network design, uh, which is the, the way in which we're looking at network infrastructure. That's an example of the sort of thinking that we need now to apply to the whole of the um, energy transition, investment in infrastructure, supply chain development, port infrastructure development, et cetera. If we don't have that underpinning plan, then it's very difficult to see how we'll make the right investments at the right time. Um, so if I could wrap up, I'd say that, you know, the good news is that there's a fantastic opportunity for ports. Floating wind is opening up whole new areas of seabed for development, and there's a lot of ports that can take advantage of that. It's great to see some of the MOUs that are coming, coming forward between developers and port operators. And I think that's clearly you know, the start of a process. Uh, but there is a fundamental challenge in, around investment, and that's gonna require public sector support and, a, um, and financial backing. And also we need an, an overarching plan, a delivery plan that investors can look at with confidence and can make their decisions based on that. So thanks very much. I'll pass back to Richard. Well, thanks very much, Johnny. That's a very interesting opening thoughts. And we've got, as I said before, we've got time for some Q&A uh, after the introductory comments. And indeed, I think also as well as the, the kind of main fo focus of today's uh, event on offshore renewables, offshore wind it, particularly, we can also touch on things like hydrogen, clean fuels and other um, <coughs> changes in the energy sphere that ports are responding to. Uh, but before we touch on those, um, delighted to welcome uh, Cassell Chang uh, from Arup, who's going to share some of his thoughts as well. Cassell, just remind us, uh, a lot of people know who Arup are, but just remind us about yourselves briefly and, and Arup and, and what you're doing over there. All right, sure. Thanks for that, Richard. Um, just brief introduction to myself. I'm uh, a maritime infrastructure engineer. Um, have been for, for many years now and traditionally have grown up with ports, uh, coastal infrastructure, but most recently in the last, uh, in a way, I guess my personal experience has transitioned from uh, moving dry bulk and coal, uh, having grown up in Australia, through to uh, LNG as I moved to the UK. And most recently in the last 10 years uh, has primarily been in renewables. So a lot of offshore wind and uh, most recently in the last few years have started to look at uh, sort of more, the more derived uh, alternative fuels. Um, and there's been a, a really interesting interplay how uh, bringing ammonia uh, or, or methanol in through via our ports um, and, and using some of the renewable power um, has been really, really interesting. So some of the things that um, I'll, I'll try and dovetail into what uh, the, the introduction that Johnny's given, uh, just so we're not saying exactly the same thing, but a lot of the work that uh, we've been doing here at Arup um, over the last few years has been looking at port and supply chains. And I think Johnny's touched on the fact that yes, there is a need for investment, but this is a need that that's actually through the industry. Um, and we've looked at beyond the UK, uh, we've seen similar sort of issues out across continental Europe. And a lot of this problem has been exacerbated by the fact that turbines are getting bigger componentry are getting bigger so there's a much much bigger demand on the port infrastructure but also because of uh, the need or, or, or the invent of floating wind which has significantly increased the demands on the port infrastructure in a um, almost in an arms race really with the wind turbine technology providers of, of trying to catch up um, so bigger keys uh, bigger loadout platforms so on and so forth um, so that's what we've been trying to have a look at and how to identify where the pinch points are, uh, how to bring in uh, some of the necessarily components for either A, manufacture or B, assembly before uh, final send out. Um, I guess one of the things I I'll, I'll, won't touch on uh, what's happening on the West Coast, but uh, there are opportunities um, similarly <clears throat> Uh, for the East Coast and, and, and West Coast. Um, 
what we're seeing, one of the big signals out to the market with, with floating wind uh, has been with Scott Wind and what's happening up in Scotland. So the Scottish ports are out there um, and again, getting themselves in line for investment, uh, for upgrading and, and, and how to respond to that. And in a way, almost beyond just before that, and, and the really interesting segue into the energy sector, uh, we had been looking at Scottish ports for a number of years just before this, uh, was very much in terms of decommissioning. So the North Sea oil assets needed to come, they need to come on shore at some point. Uh, and again, they are really some complementary uh, demands on infrastructure in terms of, again, big keys, deeper keys, uh, large expense, large-ish uh, sort of land spaces to help facilitate, uh, bring in some of the North Sea assets. And there is a complementary use uh, potentially of the infrastructure, um, depending on how, how things uh, are played out between balancing uh, floating wind going out, uh, potentially some of the decommissioning work. So uh, that, 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 was, that was something that I want to try and touch on. Um, also, similarly, as, we, as we're seeing some of the Southern North Sea assets are maturing, um, in terms of what's happening on the East Coast, there will be a opportunities potentially for ports to have a, another think again or, or get a second bite at the cherry, um, as it were, as some of the older wind farms come up for life extension work, uh, major repowering, as major components are starting need to be replaced, um, as the cells start to come home again, there is, there should be, or, or what we're anticipating is there will be another buzz of activity again uh, for, for, for the East Coast ports. So, and again, th those learnings are something that we could be bringing out to Scotland, out to the West Coast uh, of where things have gone right or, or where things have gone wrong um, in terms of some of those lessons learned um, in terms of how to manage uh, 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 some of the fixed wind, wind existing wind farms. Um, as Johnny touched on, a lot of the floating wind work, we, we, we slightly know um, that everyone wants bigger keys, deeper keys, uh, heavier loading pads. I think one of the really interesting things that we don't know of yet um, is how to take care of, of floating wind. Um, We've launched demonstrators so far. Um, at most, we've probably or are trying to attempt to launch, say, almost a dozen machines or half a dozen machines, if that. Um, looking after them at the moment or major maintenance is uh, something that the industry is trying to ha get a handle on. Uh, at the moment, do we tow the entire machine back home? That's something that we couldn't do with, with, with fixed wind. Um, there will be implications of that. And it's very much a uh, emerging learning field. So uh, can't say we have all the answers yet, but it, it, it's something that uh, we would look forward to, to, to exploring <laughs> uh, with everyone, I think. Um, I think that's, that's probably me at, at the moment, but- uh, Thank we... you, Cassell. Great, great to hear your thoughts. I mean, you're here for Q and A as well, so please don't log off just yet. Yes, <laughs> no, it's interesting. No, 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 no. So I just remind uh, those of you uh, remotely joining us, please do uh, lodge some questions in the Q and A uh, function uh, of Zoom, and uh, we can lodge your questions, pass them across. Um, I think I'll just ca I'll kick off if it's all right, uh, Johnny. Uh, you mentioned the possibility, one of the things, you, many things you mentioned was the possibility of under, underwriting the risk for ports in terms of um, the investments they make. And I think it's quite, it would be quite right to tease out, you know, there could be a lot of questions. Why, why aren't the ports responding quicker, et cetera? What, what, what's the kind of, what is the risk there? Just, do you want to flesh that point out? And then perhaps um, if you've got any ideas about how you would underwrite that, the actual nitty gritty, how you do that would have, would a government agency take a stake in a port or is it is it another sort of financial uh, mechanism you were thinking of there? You're on mute. Sorry, Johnny. It's only been three years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the risk a, a little bit um, further. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in the sort of opening statement, there's, there's kind of two main risks. One risk is that projects don't go ahead. 
And actually, if you look at the round three, the fallout rate of projects is, is, is quite high. I mean, a, a large number of projects in the round three wind farms didn't go ahead. Um, so if you are making an investment based on one or even a small number of projects, you've got to factor in the fact that those projects may not happen and for, and for a, a very wide variety of reasons as well. So it's not just one thing that you have to look out for. It could be through planning, it could be through um, the, the, the CFD auction round, for example, you know, your project might not win a CFD auction. There's a fundamental risk there that could then impact on the revenues coming through to the, the ports themselves. Um, so one way around that risk would be to have a very big portfolio of projects and to have the project stretching as far into the future as possible so that you've got the best, the best chance and the best kind of, of uh, the best visibility of those projects. If we take the Celtic Sea as an example, um, big step forward going from one gigawatt of projects to what we're now looking at as a leasing run for four gigawatts of projects. So that's an improvement. But really, if you were going to make a massive investment in port infrastructure at, say, Port Talbot or Milford Haven, you'd want to see beyond the four gigawatts to what's coming next. And the Crown Estate has talked about perhaps going to 10 or even 20 gigawatts at some point in the future, but you don't have confidence that that's actually going to happen. The second risk is a, is a straightforward kind of commercial timing risk that in order for you to make the investment needed to have the port infrastructure in place for the start of the project construction phase, you really need to start making that investment very early. And we know port infrastructure, planning, um, you know, harbour revisions, et cetera, environmental impacts, they are impacted by the same sort of delays and uh, constraints as, as, as the generation projects will be as well. So there is a question of timing and there's a question of when you can actually sign and make commitments, commercial commitments there. Um, so when we're talking about mitigation for that, clearly port operators are looking for some upfront support grant funding for example and the government has you know put forward the flow miss grant funding at the moment which is a reasonable amount of money to get started on some of these things and do some of the kind of feasibility studies that would be necessary and underwrite some of that upfront work but when it comes to making the big investment i think port operators will probably require some additional support particularly on the west coast where perhaps they don't have the same alternative uses that Castle was talking about. And that's a very important point, actually. Mm -hmm. If you have got alternative uses, whether it's offshore and gas decommissioning, for example, or you're bringing in other bulk cargoes, or perhaps you want to build a container co terminal anyway, and so this is kind of fitting in with your plans, okay. then that's obviously a much easier investment decision to make. Um, so people are beginning to talk about actual revenue underwriting, uh, and there's a potential through... Uh, cap and floor models where you basically have a revenue guarantee, uh, regulated asset, asset based models where you have a, a guaranteed return on investment. And when I say guaranteed, it's not absolutely guaranteed. There still has to be some risk. There's some risk sharing, risk reward sharing that could go, could go alongside those. So I do think that that may be necessary for some of the ports that we're looking at. Not all, but for some of the ports we're looking at, I think those sorts of models may be necessary. Great stuff. Thanks, Johnny. And um, Cassell, just coming back to you, uh, not on the offshore wind theme, actually, just you mentioned decommissioning. So decommissioning those offshore uh, oil and gas installations predominantly. Um, obviously, there's things happening and we've seen a lot of investment going to yeah. Shetland and, and, and parts of particularly uh, northeast and northeast Scotland and the east coast, etc. But it, it's still not particularly rapid, is it, Cassell? So <laughs> So you know what? Why no. is it that these? Why is it that, that decommissioning takes so long? Is that is it just the case of the energy developers are not mandated or incentivized to decommission, uh, or and, and it's a you know costly time, etc. Well, why does everything take so long? <laughs> I suspect it's a bit of both. It's it's one of those if because decommissioning is is seen as a as a cost effectively to the to the energy companies if they don't have to um if they don't have to bring the assets back um then then, then in a way they 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 won't um and, so they, have, and so they have an obligation it, it, to this but the obligation is they have an obligation to but it's not time limited yeah. is that the issue 
Indeed, indeed. It, right. It's a part of that, isn't it? So, um, so we talk about risk in so the unless offshore. Unless something imminent about to happen. We talk about the offshore um, wind kind of risks for ports, etc. But how can, I mean, some ports obviously will be working with uh, energy partners on decommissioning, of course. But how can um, some, perhaps more speculative kind of work in terms of decommissioning um, how can a port justify looking at that? Is that you've just got to partner with someone and hope that they're good for their, their word and they're going to decommission? I guess that's, a, um, that's an interesting one. I guess it's, it's working with some of the energy companies on, on when what, what does their real realistic pipeline actually look like. Uh, it, it, it is a lot of work uh, looking at how to safely decommission. A lot of the the decommissioning vessels and 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 the actions that, that are required use the very same vessels that we're looking at uh deploying for uh for floating wind construction that there are only so many very large vessels or, or construction vessels uh that can be deployed and so it doesn't take a lot to knock the program out by a year or two on some of those um so it is working with some of the I, I think it's it's working with some of the energy companies to get realistic uh timescales about what their decommissioning programs really look like uh when we could be ready for it and and it's almost how that fits in intermittently with um potentially other business as usual okay so now back to uh, both of you if you wouldn't mind just uh start with johnny just on the different types of activities back to offshore wind and obviously in the future floating offshore wind, um, we've got different types of activities that uh, ports can get involved in. There's obviously manufacturing mobilisation, providing service bases, and also that kind of long tail of activity under operation and maintenance that mm. tends to be, you know, kind of a smaller scale stuff, but a kind of regular and, and kind of ongoing thing for potentially up to 30 years often i just kind of wonder where's where's is, is is manufacturing there's a lot talked about the kind of aspiration and indeed several ports would be very keen to provide those landside hubs for manufacturing facilities but realistically is a lot of the, a lot of the offshore installations that are going to be introduced and uh, and facilitated through our ports are they going to be developed and manufactured elsewhere and we're just going to provide the sort of the final bit of the jigsaw or do you think there is there is potential for mass scale manufacturing in the uk i think there is potential i mean you need to break it down a little bit in terms of what has been manufactured so i mean the turbine um you know yeah let's be let's be realistic is already highly concentrated as a you know there's a handful of uh, turbine manufacturers siemens g etc um, big manufacturing hubs, mainly on the continent at the moment. It's it's difficult to see that a turbine manufacturer would set up would set up from scratch in the UK, but we are seeing other components being manufactured. Blades, for example, being manufactured in the UK. The um, there's still an opportunity, I think, if we go for steel around manufacturing the substructures in steel and the um, um, you know component parts in steel, for example. So. Port Talbot would be an ideal port for that sort of manufacturing activity. Um, with floating wind, we have the anchoring and the mooring systems, which whether, whether you just class that as manufacturing or fabrication or assembly, I, I guess it's kind of splitting hairs a little bit. But those subunits need to be brought together and they, they need to be uh, yeah, fabricated. And that, that could be certainly doable with the port infrastructure that we've got with access to, to, to steel and to, to synthetic fibres for ropes, for example, and, and, and various other things. So I, I think there's a grey area between assembly, fabrication and manufacturing. And clearly what we want to see is as much of that activity taking place in UK ports. They don't all need to take place at the assembly port that is closest to the wind farm. And I think, you know, we need to think about our model in terms of how we bring the various components together to an appropriate port, which is close enough to the wind farm for deployment. And then we've got another question, which is about operations and maintenance. And it's interesting because I made the point that we haven't quite bottomed out how we're going to do operations and maintenance, particularly of floating wind farms that may be 50 or 60 miles from shore, which is a very different proposition to operating and maintaining a wind farm that maybe is only 12 or 14 miles from shore and, and obviously you know when you get out to 50 or 60 miles the, the idea of going out in a day boat you know wind cat 
crew transfer vessel becomes less and less viable. You're, you're going to want to have a proper okay. offshore maintenance vessel and probably overnight accommodation alongside that as well. So that's a whole different set of dynamics. Um, so it, in short, Richard, I think there is opportunities for manufacturing. Um, it's probably not the big turbines, but but everything else I think is up for grabs. And Cassell, uh, uh, John has given an excellent full-on uh, response there on manufacturing, but what about sort of some of those other activities like the mobilisation and the service-based roles, which indeed a lot of ports have been already focused on in the UK on the mm. eastern and north coasts, uh, uh, kind of more free, more recently. Um, what, where, where are where, what are ports needing to do for that, for example? So that's something that we're starting to see again with, as what Johnny's alluded to, with the large as as the uh, the O and M functions effectively go. Uh, go towards bigger vessels uh, because they're, they're needing to go out, stay out at sea for longer. What we're starting to see, or, or there's bigger demands on, again, the port infrastructure, instead of going out on a day boat, we're now starting to see or plan for O&M bases for vessels that are now needing to, who could probably stay out at sea for a month at a time. And so, again, it, it, it becomes a... It sounds like a broken record almost. It, it, ports are always needing bigger keys, bigger drafts, but it's because the vessels are getting bigger. <laughs> um, but the thing is, the the O and M vessels that are coming out for for uh, sort of the next generation wind farms and that sort of thing, as they go further out, um, they're not beyond. Uh, what some of the UK ports can already provide. Uh, we, we're not finding massively bigger drafts. Um, you know, in terms of the two, three, four meters, we're probably going out towards the six to eight meter range. So that it, it's deeper, but there, there are opportunities then again for some of our medium-sized ports to quite easily accommodate for that or, or, or participate. Well, you've uh, you've nicely that service. You've nicely segued into um, some of the questions, actually, Cassell. So um, it's always the chair's delight when we've got a bit of interest from the audience. And i um, delighted to say that our good friend Phil Buckley, who's been in the sector for some time and is a consultant and specialist, um, Phil's asking, offshore renewable energy is really about assembly. Is it reasonable for all ports to feel they can get a piece of the action? Or are we more likely to see very few larger ports supporting round four on a national or regional basis. So Cassell, I'll let you go first this time. So effectively, you know, is it all <laughs> going to be concentrated in larger ports as Phil is asking, or or, or is there going to be a, a lot of business to go around, big pie to, to go around um, the wider ports industry across the UK? I just think potentially there might be uh, uh, more to go around. Uh, uh, happy for, for, for Johnny to to dispute that i think at, uh, in terms of the integration and the marshalling for that final uh, delivery of the wind farm they will have a tendency to cluster towards the bigger ports because they will have the bigger uh marshalling areas the heavier keys so on and so forth but in the lead up to that there is still a lot of component parts uh that need to be either a manufactured or assembled or brought together uh so that that last push uh, port closest to the wind farm that that uh, installation assembly port closest to the wind farm actually can can do its job effectively. Um, so this is really a, um, a a supply chain logistics really almost that every you know hopefully that people can play a part. But obviously the wind farm developers want to minimise the number of movements that that these. Uh, have to take but at some point the the biggest ports will get clustered they will get too busy and there won't be a choice uh, that, you know it, there will be a trickle down effectively to some extent uh, whether everyone gets a gets a bite uh, not so sure but hopefully it'll spread out further than what people think <laughs> Cassell, thank you. And, and Johnny, I see you nodding your head in agreement. Yeah, I would, I, yeah. I would agree with that. I mean, we've spoken to a number of wind farm developers who's, who've said, given the choice, they would want to have everything in one place. And that's partly from a logistical point of view and partly from a project management point of view. You're just being able to look out the window and see all the components coming together rather than relying on, on several different ports. But the reality is, um, you know, some, some activities can be done in large ports, concentrated hubs, for example, but some activities do lend themselves to being closer to 
the wind farm that's been built. And I mentioned anchoring and mooring systems, for example, which would be significant for floating offshore wind. And, and it would make sense potentially to mobilize them from a port which is relatively close to the to the wind farm. What, one other factor which I think we need to get our head around is how far can you tow a floating wind turbine when it's fully assembled? What's the practical <laughs> logistics of that? And, and it's not just a question of the physical towage, it's also a question of weather windows and insurance, et cetera. So, you know, we've had people saying to us, well, we wouldn't want to go more than 24 hours or maybe 48 hours if you were towing a fully assembled wind farm, because yeah. that would take you out with the weather window that you could predict and the insurance around that. Now, if you're only towing at three knots, um, 24 hours is not very far. You know, we're talking about a distance there of sort of maybe 60, 70 miles. So even towing from, let's say, Belfast to the Celtic Sea might take you two or three days. So there's a kind of limitation around that as well. And, and that also calls into question, you know, could you assemble these wind turbines in, on the continent, let's say in Cherbourg or in Dunkirk, and tow them around mm -hmm. to the Celtic Sea or even up to the north of Scotland? The answer is probably not. So that's going to be a factor. Great stuff. Uh, we've got a question here from Alistair Young, um, who's lodged something. Does the UK infrastructure industry have the skills in design and planning to deliver uh, the potential pipeline of port upgrades? Same question uh, with regard to construction delivery and in particular pinch points. Perhaps, uh, Johnny, you, you've got any thoughts on construction capability and capacity? In, in terms of the wind farm construction or the port upgrade uh, i think it's port upgrades in the port. um i don't i don't have a great insight into that i mean I, I i suppose like every other bit of infrastructure in the uk we are short on those generic skills around infrastructure planning environmental planning consenting etc um i mean it's an interesting one in terms of when hinkley comes off stream so hinkley construction finishes around about 2028 a huge number of supply chain companies and skills and capabilities will be rolling out of Hinkley. And if there's not another nuclear power station to be built immediately, then that capability would be available to, to look at ports. And, and we've already had discussions, for example, between Hinkley and some of the ports around the Southwest. So there's, a, there's an opportunity there. And, and as Castle mentioned, I mean, decommissioning oil and gas, et cetera. I think if we're creative about it, we probably can find the skills that we need, but we do need to have that that plan that I talked about right at the beginning. We we, we desperately need a plan that, that people can then begin to, to work around. Yeah. Sal, have you got any thoughts on that point? Yeah, sure. Um, well, in terms of the, 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 the design and planning skills, I, I, I think there is. Um, I, I'd like to think that there's less. Um, Personally, at, at Arab, I'm finding that there's always competition. Every time I'm bidding for to to, to replan or, or or come up with ideas for 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 ports to to respond to offshore wind, so I think that is there. In terms of the construction logistics, uh, the, the construction capability, as Johnny said, I think the supply chain is probably there somewhere, but there just needs to be that investment or or, or the commitment almost from the industry to show that this is coming, and so in the way that those baseline skills are, are about in the UK, I, I, I believe, and the capability is there. Um, and if nothing else, I think, embarrassingly, there are the uh, the continental contractors who do come across uh, some of the big Europeans, but they do hire that local workforce. So in a sense, UK PLC, in a sense, doesn't lose out. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that that is there. Um, I, I suspect so is some of the pinch points might be is possibly further down the field when we start constructing offshore um that that might i i think that's always been uh, uh something of, of concern because mm -hmm. getting people trained up for that it is harder and takes yeah. longer uh kind of similar vein although a bit more sort of politically sensitive i guess <laughs> i'm glad ben carlton jones is asking this because uh, this is one of my kind of bugbears i usually raise so i'm glad that someone else is raising it UK content, uh, he's using the term targets. I would probably use the word aspirations. But uh, we've seen that uh, with offshore renewables, there is a 6% aspiration from the government for UK content. So Ben's question is, can UK content targets be met without manufacturing? So Cassell, do you want to kind of um, 
have, have a, a kind of stab at that one and we'll come to Johnny oh. afterwards. I think I might need Johnny's help on this one. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the local content has been met so far, <clears throat> excuse me, to date actually with O&M because that long tail that, that we talk about um, has been a lot of that into facilitating the, the, the local content part of it. Um, I think in a sense what we've lost with the first few rounds of fixed wind is that a lot of the uh the manufacturing capability is that that capability has been lost to the to continental europe or, or, or the mainland in terms of how uh large monopiles uh how towers are being manufactured um it, that there has been factories that have been opened in the uk but unfortunately have subsequently closed and so because again uh, as johnny said it's it's all hinges back to uh having a pipeline or, or security of orders for those guys um to know them for them to have confidence to, to keep um that manufacturing base going yeah so, thank you. and johnny yeah, i think it, i think i think it was you who mentioned chicken and egg but it, there's many <clears> chicken <throat> and eggs in this area and one of those obviously is about ports providing the infrastructure or having the infrastructure ready for the energy developers to come and kind of use and utilize etc and the energy developers of course sort of holding off and saying well it, you know that infrastructure is not ready so we're going to use existing facilities and infrastructure on the continent or elsewhere which obviously saves them money uh, they don't have to yeah. invest in new infrastructure here so there's a bit of a kind of challenge for sort of ports and and the energy to customers and as one of the energy providers said to me recently we just you know without UK content rules and without the infrastructure, both of them, we're not going to do anything or do as much here. And that's just something government needs to accept and swallow. But I, of course I challenge them and say, well, what happens if they were mandated? And they sort of scratch their head and say, well, we'd have to have another think about things then. <laughs> but uh, now I'm not talking about every grain of steel being you know, <clears throat> mandated that it's got to be produced in somewhere else. You mentioned Port Talbot earlier, maybe, maybe they would kind of support that, but um there's got to be kind of more we can do to encourage people to sort of to base things here so that ports can make those investments and take that risk uh, in a more sort of measured way. So there is, there's, a, there's a tension at play here. We talked to a lot of wind farm developers. And so the situation at the moment is that they are expected to produce a supply chain plan as part of their application for a contract for difference. And uh, yeah, interesting, you picked up whether it's a target or it's an aspiration, but there is a there is an expectation that that supply chain plan will feature regional, local, and UK content. And a number has been kicked around, whether it's 50% or 60%, whether that constitutes a target or not is not very clear. But this, what is clear is that there's an expectation that developers will seek to maximize the UK content. Um, now, it's difficult because the biggest thing in the turbine is the is the turbine itself is the nacelle is the, is the is the generator and invariably they're not manufactured in the UK, so then you're looking at everything else and and we have missed a trick I think with monopiles etc. I mean we probably should have invested in the rolling capability to produce monopiles sort of ten years ago and we didn't do that and and that's quite a specialist and Johnny Johnny capability. just just to come in there sorry to interrupt when you say we should have invested is that UK well, industry is that UK government or is that a sort of I, bit of everyone? Yeah, you, you, UK government as part of the sector deal mm. should probably have identified that as being a high priority. Maybe trying to find either an inward investor or an existing company that could have made that investment. I remember at the time there was discussions about having a a, a monopile rolling plant in South Wales. In fact, there was one in South Wales, but they couldn't manufacture the diameter of monopiles that were needed for offshore wind they were they were going up to sort of three or four meters not the sort of seven eight meter diameters that we have in the offshore wind sector and then we've had other kind of abortive investments remember bifab was manufacturing a um, jackets for example for offshore wind and then i'm not quite sure where they are at the moment but you know the kind of the peak and trough of the demand always was difficult because you could never be sure of having a consistent order book you know to make that level of investment. And that's kind of crazy because we really ought to be able to, ma to manage that much better to make sure that we did have that order book in place. And I, I don't want to go over just the sort of failure of British industry and our industrial strategy, which kind of 
we could probably talk about a lot. Um, <laughs> but there is there are, there is and there are opportunities to increase the amount of local, regional, and national content. I think that the industry is willing to do that. There is one sting though, which is that ultimately we're also asking these companies to bid against each other in a competitive process to get a contract for difference. So that CFD, you know, sort of Damocles hanging over them is that if they are a, f- a few dollars more expensive per megawatt hour than their competitor, oh. then they risk not getting a contract for difference. And that has a big impact on their project. So there is a tension between us wanting to drive down the cost of energy to the minimum amount that we possibly can versus us wanting to increase UK content. And we might have to think about that. We might have to consider, well, is there some other way in which we want to allocate leases in the first instance and contracts for difference, if that's the way forward, to recognise increased regional UK content within the, um, w- within the supply chain. At the moment, we, we don't do that. And so I think it's reasonable for developers to say, well, look, you're asking me for the lowest cost as the priority. Secondary consideration at the moment is UK content. And, and just to kind of follow this, as well as the um, UK content roles, we're obviously looking at uh, quite a kind of tight time scale in terms of what we, what we have in terms of our aspirations. And just a supplementary that really sort of alongside that, what government could do, one thing it could do is is invest better and and perhaps streamline some of those planning and consenting processes. So, Johnny, first of all, just briefly, if you wouldn't mind, is is it a bit of a provocative question? Is it fair to say that, I mean, obviously, uh, that that East Coast you mentioned and the north north parts of Scotland with Scotland, etc. There have been successes. You know, we've 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 got there. We are up and running with offshore wind, offshore renewables, etc. Although, you know, the caveat to that is there's a lot more to come, both there and on the Celtic Sea. So is our planning system, our marine consenting system fit for purpose? And not just in the areas around where the wind turbines will be, but also in those coastal regions around ports where they do, you mentioned harbour revision orders and other consents. Yeah, yeah. You know, those developments, perhaps the government is not really thinking about fast tracking the planning consenting processes on the land side or, or around the land areas. They're just thinking about the actual offshore wind farms themselves. But is the planning system fit for purpose? Well, I, I, I'm a bit reluctant to jump on the bandwagon and say, oh, the planning system's not fit for purpose. It's all the problem of planning and marine consents, et cetera, because I can see that projects are making their way through that. There are delays and there are lead times that I think we could look at. So it's not so much kind of watering down the process or watering down the, the requirements, but maybe looking at some of the lead times, particularly around data gathering, for example. So I mean, the Celtic Sea is a good example where we can shortcut and streamline the planning process if a lot of that data gathering is done up front and perhaps invested in and paid for by uh, by either the Crown Estate or the public sector or by a consortium of developers, rather than each developer approaching each project as a brand new start, having to go out and gather data about fisheries and birds and sea bed conditions and all of that. So I think we can streamline a lot of that. The decision-making process then on the back end as well, I think could be streamlined. I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, reducing six months off the planning process or reducing it by 12 months would make a fantastic difference given that we've got a long pipeline of projects going out over the next 10 or 15 years. I think what we need to think about is how we strategically plan for those projects to come on stream and go through their various phases of pre-construction, construction construction Mm. and and post-construction in a way that dovetails in with the capability that we have in the supply chain and the capability that we have in the ports. So there is a natural kind of, um, should we call it, you know, this this requires strategic planning and scheduling basically to make sure that we don't end up with a situation whereby we have peaks of trying to deploy four or five gigawatts in one year don't have the capacity to do that we end up then having to use imported vessels or, or, or workforce for example driving up costs and then two years later we have a dearth of projects and nothing happening and that's what we want to avoid we want to avoid those peaks and troughs 
Yeah. So uh, the, the the planning system's part of that, but I, d- I don't think it's the biggest thing as, as part of that. Oh, fair enough. That's um that's very measured. But um, obviously, um, Johnny is not on the bandwagon. Casella, are you on that bandwagon about hammering <laughs> planning and consenting? Because uh, some people are, and of course, other people have what... consent. <laughs> A kind of sensible approach to this. No, thing, so. I, 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 no, I think I'm with Johnny on that one. It's, it's as, as much as I'd like to bash somebody else. It, it, it is probably something that, uh, it, it, you, at most, if we only ever save six months, and that's not the, that's not the end of the world, or that 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 won't solve the problem. I, I think where, where what Johnny was has been saying, and we've known also getting into that is. If there was that almost as a national scale, that strategic plan um, of, of, of almost how people could, how particular ports or how particular facilities can participate, who is likely to come up as potentially some of the different tiers of, of the ports that may be required to, to meet this this industry uh we're not sort of saying every port should should gear themselves and and expand themselves to a point where they're delivering uh you know half a gigawatt worth of of offshore wind but it's sort of you know everyone can get a slice of this if everyone uh slightly swims swims within their lane i guess um and and yeah. sort of know where where they could be um i think i, I, think, I, think, I think the one thing i would pick part up of it. Stop- behalf of our members is um it's not always six months <laughs> it could be a lot longer no. than that, depending on what <laughs> you're doing of course and where you're located yes um and having a swift planning process is a, and a you know a quick decision making is attractive to yes, inland yeah, investors yeah, so yeah. that's i think that's a serious Indeed, point necessary. there um we've got loads yeah, I, more I, questions I, actually. I definitely think time. so um, I definitely think the planning process can be improved upon, and I think that there is definitely opportunities to, to, to reduce the timing. Um, I think the point I was making is that some of those may be looking at the process itself, the data gathering, et cetera, how that can be streamlined, rather than reducing the requirements or making the, you know, trying to water down the rules. It's the process itself that could be um, mm-hmm. streamlined. So on the subject of planning, Please, so we've got Nick Orbell, who's a planning specialist from the ports industry, is joined us today, he's asked a question. Ooh. And I'll um, combine this with another one we had from an, at- an anonymous attendee earlier, which was about free ports. But Nick's asking, are investment zones, so this is the Liz Trust sort of experiment, so to speak, tax beneficial zones uh, proposed by UK, UK government, attractive to developers, bearing in mind the tax benefits and simplified planning regime. Um, I, I would assume they are. And alongside that, the other question we had was what were the potential impacts of free ports have on uh, the viability um, for investment in port infrastructure, et cetera. So, um, Cassell, do you want to go first? Presumably tax benefits and Ooh, incentives would be welcome. I, I can only say that they are, they would be welcome. And there, there's a number of Scottish ports that are competing for their round of that. Um, as well, we're, we're seeing we're seeing the benefits of that, um, especially now down at the Tees, uh, where, where, where where Tees ports have been granted a free port status, and we are seeing investments uh, down there. You, there there's been um, two uh, wind farm or, or, or wind component suppliers who've moved up there who are uh, building new manufacturing capabilities there. Um, so that is definitely a, a, a benefit. And so if, if there was more of it to go around, and again, to help the emerging uh, West Coast ports, that, that I suspect that would be something that would be very welcome. Uh, Johnny, just a, just a slight um, handbrake on Nick's very good question, actually, is that we did see some media coverage last week suggesting that investment zones may be scrapped yeah. by the government. So um, <laughs> I think there's kind of strong support from the industry. If, if you get one from the ports industry, mm. they'd love to be located either within or in very close proximity to investment zones. But if they're not going to go ahead, that's one thing. But what, what's your kind of general view, Johnny? I mean, we I, you mentioned planning. We've mentioned that, I think. But the, the actual tax benefits, is that a sort of um, is that an incentive that we could we could offer instead of mandating content, for example? Yeah, I think I, th- I think it is. I mean, you, you mentioned the investment zones and they might not go ahead. It's, it's another blog. I'm pleased that I didn't bother writing because I was there's several things I was going to comment on from Liz Truss's time as prime minister, but they, um, they seem to have fallen away. We've been looking at free port, particularly around Plymouth, and trying to understand exactly what that what it really opens up. 
and, and I think the, the main area that opens up is around manufacturing. If you can add value in some way to a manufacturing process or maybe manufacturing hydrogen, for example, and then you're then exporting that or exporting those components, that's where the free port really comes in. Whether it would benefit you if you were just using it to assemble an offshore wind farm, which you're then going to deploy in UK waters, is, is probably less clear. So I think it's really around the manufacturing processes that could be embedded within the within the freeport area or where you're you know you're you're importing components adding value and then exporting something as well so i think yeah definitely of benefit but it's it's going to be quite particular to the um to the opportunity at the individual port right great we've got uh, quite a few questions have come through so i just warn the audience we may not have time to come to anything further you lodge so if you want to save yourself um, uh, kind of typing out huge questions, uh, feel free to do that. Another one, uh, it is one uh, from Enola Williams. Are there geographical advantages for African ports? I don't know if Cassell, do you want to quickly uh, cover that one off? Is there sort of, you know, not just African, but also sort of non-UK ports, or is this going to be okay. all sewed up by ports. the ports industry as the, mm. um, the Association for UK Ports hopes very much? But <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I suspect there could be. Um, again, as Johnny alluded to, um, that final mile, that final last uh, assembly and delivery installation, that that has to be close. And, and that almost, uh, there is a distinct geographical advantage to be uh, in the UK, uh, simply because towing distances or traveling distances uh, need to be so short. Uh if we were really looking at supply of component parts, again, that there, there, there could be something then for um, a wider supply chain to help supply that. Um, at the moment, a lot of component parts are supplied, say, out of the Middle East or, or shipped in all the way from Asia, uh, simply because they've got the capabilities and which which we're lacking here. Um, but again, th th this is where we're talking about how how we switch up that that manufacturing content. <laughs> I think oh, lovely, and it's quickly just come. James Darbush has asked one about uh, grant funding, etc. And I think just kind of squared off without sort okay. of asking the panel uh, members on this. James James asks about whether we need some, um, you know, kind of better collaboration between government and industry to attract that investment. I, th I think the, the point is James that government has some money. Um, uh, Johnny mentioned low miss, uh, 160 million pound um, funding from uh, Bayes. But there's also quite a lot of, of private money that is out there uh, and ports can attract that quite easily, I would say, subject to there being business cases. And it's a question of whether or not the developers are actually going to come through or, or sort of start delivering. But um, uh, another one for Phil Bullen, just very quickly, I can give Johnny, can I give you the last word, actually, because we're going to have yeah, to go tie things off, actually, because I know you were keen to mention hydrogen and Phil Buckley again has mm. asked, is there enough capacity in round four to generate green hydrogen systems at scale? And if you want to cover that and maybe touch on green hydrogen moving forward in about 30 seconds, I don't know if you can do that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we, we, we definitely need to begin to manufacture green hydrogen at scale. By green, we mean by electrolysis using renewable electricity. I think the government set a target for five gigawatt capacity. Um, at, you know, I, I would say, and, and that's total hydrogen, I think at least that in green hydrogen by 2035. The analysis we've done with National Grid um, in our project, a day in the life of electricity system 2035, suggests that we need a significant amount of green hydrogen manufacturing capacity. And we also need to be able to store that hydrogen. And we also need to be able to convert that hydrogen back into electricity, as well as using it for industrial processes and indeed for marine transport. So I would definitely put hydrogen in the shopping list of opportunities for any port. I think, um, uh, Johnny, that's excellent. I think it's probably a subject for a whole other webinar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> final, I, I, we won't ask the question, but thank you, Andy Bullen from Compass Handbooks uh, asked a similar point actually about uh, fuel, et cetera. So again, there's a bit of um, movement there. Uh, and also you and McGarvey, sorry, we have time to come to your question about securing funding, etc. Look, let's uh, let's wrap this up now. Thank you so much to Johnny and Cassell. Uh, if you can join me by virtually applauding uh, our excellent speakers.
that really has been an informative and um, excellent session. And it's for an hour that flew by, I have to say. So thank you so much again uh, to our uh, guests. And also thank you to our um, um, uh, delegates who've joined us. A little plug, and that's for the uh, UK Ports Conference organised by Waterfront, uh, which is on the 24th and the 25th of May uh, next year. We're having a soft launch, I'm advised by uh, Waterfront shortly, um, with some more details to follow. So if you want to get involved with that, that's a physical event. Um, they're very pleased that they've invited me to chair the session again. I think it's one of the highlights for the uh, Ports calendar. So if you can jot that in your diaries, uh, we'd love to see you there. And there's plenty of opportunities to ask lots of questions on both offshore renewables and other energy um, activities. So thanks again from me, thanks to our speakers, and until next time, have a nice day.